Ada halang kat sekarang? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm here, sir. He's there. Yeah, good evening. Good evening. Good evening, sir. How is Delhi and what is the climate now? Uh, it's cold, sir. Very, very cold. Very, it must be very, very cold. cold. Uh -huh. Yes, uh, a new cold wave. <laughs> and uh, last week in uh, San Francisco, it was uh, minus, minus two, minus three. Early morning. Delhi is 13. Oh, great. This must be very pleasant. Must be. 13 yes, is pleasant here. <laughs> here they say 13 is pleasant. So yes, 13 is pleasant. <laughs> Unless it, it's windy. I mean, you don't go out, so you don't know. <laughs> yeah, but there should not be any pollution uh, with that. Uh, AQA is better now. Yeah, AQA is better now. Yeah. The odd even ratio is still going on. I mean, odd no. even uh, that uh, method of committing the vehicle. In Delhi, they have started, no, that odd even number just lying there, on no. the road. No, no, sir. They have not. Just a weekend lockdown was there. And 10 to 5 midnight curfew. Yeah, the has um, come everywhere. Raja Raman, sir, good evening. I see you. Uh, there's some uh, echo coming from your device. I think uh, you're trying to log in. Uh... Hello. Ah, good evening, sir. Finally, yeah. Uh, good evening, sir. Okay. Yeah, it's better now, sir. Yeah. Uh, better. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what has happened. Good evening, Rajan sir. Hello, good evening, sir. How are you? That's good. Where are you now? How's How's Chennai? Oh, Chennai is uh, yeah, getting a little climate. warmer now. The climate is okay for uh, this month. It's okay, but uh, getting a warmer a little bit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> good. Warm is good. <laughs> yeah, warm is here. Yeah. Well, next month it will become hot. <laughs> Correct. One minute to go, everyone. I ask everyone to stand by. Uh, we'll go live in one minute. <clears throat> Sorry. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the third chapter in the second series of masterclasses brought to you by the ISO Academic Council. I invite our president-elect, Dr. Prafal Das, sir, to kindly open the session and introduce the examiners for today. Dr. P. K. Das, sir. Good evening. Our respected teachers and uh, uh, dear uh, students, so, in the absence of uh, President ISO, Dr. Toprani, so I have got the privilege of uh, welcoming this session of uh, third uh, session of um, Series 2 Master Class of ISO. So, as you know, uh, during last pandemic, we had a very, very uh, good, successful 
master class and it went up to 25 very uh, successfully under the leadership of Dr. Subramaneshwar Rao, associated by Dr. Srijan Sukla, who managed very well the show. And uh, uh, obviously, the leadership uh, was with all four zonal leaders, like uh, uh, Dr. Arun Chaturvedi, Dr. Uh, Kiran Kothari, Dr. Uh, Lalatendu Sarangi, Dr. Raja Ramana. So we thought this year also we will continue the with the same uh, spirit, but with some modifications. Like uh, last year we had long case and one student was there. So this year we have uh, changed a little, and uh, this time we'll be having two students, and uh, more like short cases, sometimes long case, and. Uh, with the same leadership uh, continued. So I must thank uh, Dr. Uh, Subramaneswar Rao for the purpose. So let me have the opportunity to uh, uh, introduce uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Raman Despande, who, uh, who is a very well-known figure and will be introduced by our uh, uh, convener aptly. And, uh, Dr. Laleng uh, Darlan, he is uh, AMS from, uh, M MS from AMS and he had a fellowship from uh, thoracic surgery from South Korea and he's the chief of the thoracic oncosurgery, chest well deformity clinic, Rajiv Gandhi Cancer Institute, Delhi. He's the first in the country to perform advanced NUSS during uh, using techniques of uh, pectoscopy, grain leaf, Vectors, tunneloscopy for chest wall disorders. He is a course director, uh, one one year uh, thoracic oncology fellowship program in association with uh, IACTS. And I welcome, sir. I also welcome Dr. Uh, Avishek Jain, who is associate professor and unit head in the Department of Surgical Oncology. Uh, in the division of breast and thoracic surgery. I was a, a proud privileged alumni of that institute of uh, uh, GCRI. So I welcome you, sir, for uh, as being an examiner today. And I also welcome Dr. Uh, Devyani uh, Niyogi, uh, who is uh, she is assistant professor in thoracic surgery TMH Mumbai. She had done her fellowship after uh, MCH at TMH itself. So I welcome all. And uh, let me hand over to Dr. Uh, Subramaneshwar Rao to introduce the chairperson. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. We invite Dr. T.S. Rao to kindly introduce our chairperson for today. It's indeed a great privilege and pleasure to introduce my own teacher. While I was in uh, Tata Memorial for the compulsory peripheral posting, he was truly impressive. Both the work culture and the, and the skills he had shown, especially in thoracic uh, surgery. It was very in, in, inspiring. And uh, it's, it's no wonder that uh, he stays as a pioneer in forensic surgery in this part of the world. And, uh, and uh, 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 he himself chairing this session adds a glow to the ISO masterclass. As a formality, I would need to introduce him, although each one who has logged in would be knowing him. He's, Currently, the chairman of the Asian Cancer Institute, Mumbai. He has pioneered thoracoscopy initially at Kidwa Institute of Oncology. I missed him there because I, I joined him a little, I joined Kidwa a little later. And then at Tata Memorial Hospital between 1986 and 2002. He has pioneered several procedures for upper esophageal malignant and benign disorders. Multiple publications in national and international journals and book chapters on carcinoma, esophagus, lung, mediastinum, chest wall tumors in 
uh, many textbooks. He is the former president of Indian Society of Oncology, winner of several individual honors, orations, including the prestigious Padma Sri Award in 2014. I would request Dr. Ramakan, called Raman Deshpande by friends and his dear students, to take over and conduct the proceedings. Thank you very much. So you're muted, sir. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you very much uh, for those kind words. I'm very happy to be amongst friends and that's what ultimately matters. Uh, <clears throat> we all keep talking in terms of cancer esophagus, cancer lung all the time. And I'm very happy that the ISO has chosen chest wall tumors, which is a very, very interesting and very challenging uh, topic uh, for discussion. So today, uh, I think we will have the uh, case discussions by uh, Darlong and uh, others. And the moderator is uh, uh, one of our own, Dr. Deviani. So uh, may I invite the people uh, to come on uh, uh, the, the platform, please? Thank you so much, sir. Uh, the examinees for today will be Dr. Suganda Arya, who's a resident uh, from KGMU Lucknow, and Dr. Rahul Gupta, who's a resident in surgical oncology from Rajiv Gandhi Cancer Institute, New Delhi. A few instructions for the session for the examinees. Uh, we kindly request you to give to the point answers. No candidate is ever expected to know everything, so no harm in mentioning. If you do not know something, it saves us time and maintains the flow of the webinar. Uh, our examiners have the habit of giving hints all the time. It's up to you to catch it. For our dear examiners and the moderator, in interest of online viewers, both live as well as the future viewers on YouTube, we please request you to give the expected answers to the questions that remain unanswered or have been incorrectly answered. For the participants who are there live, uh, many senior ISO members are there online. We request you to post in your inputs as well in the chat box. They are highly appreciated. And for the residents, this is a unique opportunity to clear your doubts. Please make full use of it. The first case discussion part will have 45 minutes. Uh, I'll be reminding the moderator at 30 minutes and at the conclusion. I uh, now hand over the mic to Dr. Devani to kindly uh, take the case discussion forward. Thank you. Um. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Srijan and uh, Dr. Rao. This is absolutely a fantastic platform and I think it's gonna be really, really good for all the residents as well. Uh, I'd like to welcome the examiners, Dr. Dalong and Dr. Abhishek Jain onto the platform and uh, also the examinees, Rahul and Sugandha, wish you all the very best. And um, I hope, I'm sure actually that all of us are going to benefit from this discussion. Um, in the interest of time, we'll go on to the first case. So what we've done here is we have three cases uh, with all the relevant clinical information and the imaging. And um, we'll take the discussion as and when uh, with all of us in tow. Uh, I've also tried to include a few complications so that it completes the breadth of our discussion on this topic. Let's start with the first case. <clears throat> so we have a 21 year old gentleman with extremely good performance status, no comorbidities, and he complains of a left anterior chest wall swelling with chest pain since three months. And on examination, it is a hard immobile swelling and the overlying skin is essentially normal. Uh, so would the examiners want to ask anything on the history and findings since this is a short case? Yeah, uh, now long, sir. Yeah, any history of, I mean, trauma and all that to see just for completion. Yeah. Right. So this is the imaging. This is a cross-sectional imaging. Um, Dr. Sugandha, would you like to describe what you see? Uh, Dr. Sugandha, unmute yourself, please. Am I audible now? Yes, yes, yes you are. Yeah. Okay, please proceed. Uh, Ma'am, this is a mediastinal window of uh, thorax and uh, the axial section showing a well-defined uh, 
mass lesion in left and uh, left anterior hemithorax and uh, the lesion is uh, like <clears throat> lesion is well, having well defined margins and uh, uh, it seems like it is not involving the underlying structures but i want to see the lung window also if available mm. right dr dalong i think yeah, that she is the Yes, I think. Uh, what about? I mean, you have to see. I mean, uh, the extent. I mean, is it involving the sternum, uh, the the costochondral part? I think. I mean, uh, uh, sir, this is involving the costochondral part. Yes. And the uh, ribs, but uh, sternum it is not involving. Yeah. And uh, I think that's a very important point, and it's basically located in the anterior chest wall. Yes. Anterior, yes. Anterior, yeah. And yes, that's also very important. Anterior, anterior lateral. Yeah. Yes. Right, so we have uh, a left third rib extensile lesion, like Suganda mentioned, which is bulging into the second intercostal space. And like Dr. Dalong pointed out, it's involving the costochondral junction. The sternum appears free. So we go ahead and get a biopsy from this lesion, which is a PNEC or an Ewing sarcoma. Um, examiners, the floor is open to you. Um, yeah, so Dr. Rahul, this question. Uh, uh, yes, sir. What are the principles of biopsy? How do you proceed? Sir, uh, sir I would like to do a uh, CT guided or uh, image guided biopsy in it. And the uh, skin incision should be like that, that it can be incorporated in the final resected specimen. Uh, right. Okay. So, uh, I mean, uh, how exactly will you target your biopsy? You would like to go in the core of the mass, right? Yes, it should not be just a superficial biopsy. Yes, sir. It right. should. Uh, yes. Hmm. Okay. And um, would you like to do some staging workup for this? Yes, sir. I would like to do PET scan in this patient because the uh, biopsy is consistent with Ewing sarcoma. Right. So I would okay. like to do PET scan in this patient. Mm -hmm. Uh, so okay. I have a question, actually, uh, Dr. Suganda, probably you can take this. Um, would you always want to get an image-guided biopsy or yeah. would you be comfortable going in with a blind biopsy in a mass like this? Yeah, that's what I was thinking, Deviani, because, I mean, the right. mass looks quite, uh, it's quite visible. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It's solid mass and it's quite uh, visible. So I don't think you really need to go and do an image-guided biopsy. It will basically be a core needle biopsy. And uh, I don't think right. it's necessary to do an image guided. Hmm. Right. So I think uh, Dr. Dalong's made a very important point at this juncture that, uh, of course, a biopsy is a must for any mass like this, but it need not always be image guided. If you think on your clinical examination that you're going to be able to get a representative yeah. chunk with your core biopsy, if there is any doubt regarding that, or if it is a very variegated kind of a tumor clinically, then probably an image guidance would be of help. Um, all right, so staging workup, like you said, was a PET scan, which showed this lesion and that's it. No nodes, no distinct metastasis. So uh, anything else in the workup that you would like to do, or do you think that we are complete with the diagnosis and staging in this case, and we can go ahead with the treatment? So uh, one question, uh, maybe Dr. Suganda, is bone marrow, uh... Biopsy needed? Uh, sir, bo like there are two aspects of staging workup. Either yeah. we do a CCT thorax with bone marrow uh, biopsy and a, uh, bone scan, or we do a PET scan. So if we are doing a PET scan, okay. then bone marrow biopsy is not needed. Okay. Okay, so uh, uh, what percentage of chest fault tumors do you think are malignant? I mean, uh, are malignant more common or benign more common? The malignant are more common and that too, meta, uh, like secondary tumors are more, more common than primary. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it's 50-50. Yeah. Perfect. So uh, we've established that we have an upfront resectable non-metastatic Ewing sarcoma of the left anterior chest wall involving a single rib. So my question is to our examinees, we have the options given to you, Rahul and Suganda, 
both of you like one by one what is what are your, what is your how are you going to deal with this now i will give a new adjuvant chemotherapy first and followed mm-hmm. by the reassessment i would uh, like to do i would uh, like to give chemotherapy first and followed by reassessment for surgery so ganda do you right. agree with him any difference of opinion uh, no ma'am we i agree with him uh, i'll like to give a chemotherapy followed by reassessment for surgery Okay. Examiners, are you happy with this answer? Yeah. Uh, yes, yes. Mm. Yeah. So, uh, what what chemotherapy is planned for Evans sarcoma? Uh, sir, Send it back is. Send back I resume. Yeah, yeah. So, Ganda, please continue. Yes, uh, sir. It is a alternating regimen of IE and VAC, giving on three weekly duration, like uh, okay. four to six cycles of IE VAC regimen, and then followed by reassessment for surgery. Okay. Okay. so that's exactly what happened in this case um the patient received his induction chemotherapy with vac ie tolerated well without any interruptions now the medical oncologist refers the patient back to you the surgeon for further treatment so how would you like to reassess this patient rahul uh, i would like to do uh, ccd thorax only okay Examiners, is that what you follow in your practice as well? Why not a PET CT? I mean, you got a baseline PET CT which you can compare more easily. I mean, why? So CT thorax will also help in the surgical planning. I mean, you are using a con uh, PET CT. It's a PET integrated CT. You get both imaging. Yes, sir. Uh, PET CT will be PET so with not... contrast and a CT scan. Right. Would you not want to uh, see some distant METs? Yes, sir. Uh, distant met. Therapy. Yes, sir. Distant met. There can be progression of disease. Right, because Evans is a very considered very aggressive disease, right? Yes. So you would definitely want to rule out distant mets. Okay. Yes. Okay. Right. So what's important, I think, from this is we need some a contrast enhanced cross sectional imaging that mm. helps plan surgery. And like Dr. Dalong, Dr. Jain said, since we had a pet at baseline, a uh, pet at reassessment would help us. better assess the response so this is what the imaging shows almost magical like it is usually in evens uh, rahul you want to describe the uh, current scan now uh, ma'am uh, this is axial view of the ct scan of the thorax uh, uh, le- uh, there is soft tissue mass lesion in the anterolateral aspect on the left side uh, with involving grip uh, there is a significant decrease in the size uh, of the lesion and uh, no evidence of any metastasis in this case okay so, so how how will you proceed with the uh, for the treatment what are you going to do so uh, now i will uh, do the uh, by local uh, by local excision of the uh, lesion with mm. burn rip above and the burn rip below to the lesion uh and okay so it's already mentioned here how much how much margins do you take always for a malignant lesion so 4 cm okay so uh, before we go on to the excision actually i have a questions for you suganda um I would want to say that this patient has responded very, very well to chemotherapy. The lesions almost but disappeared. Do you have to operate, or is there any other option? I'm just playing the devil's advocate here. So, uh, yes, ma'am. Ma'am, we have the other option of radiotherapy in Evans sarcoma, but uh, we generally do not prefer giving radiotherapy in chest wall tumors because of uh, uh, lung toxicity. So we want to prevent lung toxicity. So we want to go ahead for surgery after. Uh, pre surgical workup and fitness right and i i would just like to make one point here and especially in uh, pediatric patients uh, you try you tend to avoid radiotherapy because there are chances of secondary malignancies right so uh, surgery is always considered a better option in pediatric population absolutely and mm-hmm. uh, so rahul you said 4 cm margin in all direction uh, dimensions uh, what edit, do you have any evidence mm-hmm. that you would want to quote for that and is it always possible to get a 4 cm margin then uh, may name should be the arjuro resection but king set all in 1980 says that 4 cm margin uh, is better compared to the 2 cm margin uh, local recurrence rates are much uh, lesser 
uh, with four centimeter margins, but there was no difference in the survival. Uh, it is not uh, always possible to take four centimeter margins. So main aim should be the R zero resection, and the minimum mm. two centimeter margin should be taken. Uh, Dr. Dalong, so, actually, I would want yeah. you to comment on this. I mean, um, yes. since you're the guy for chest wall tumors, is the four centimeter margin what you aim for in your resection study? We'll try and aim for four centimeter, but it's not necessary. I mean, like in this case, it does involve one rip. So we basically try to go one rip above and one rip below. I mean, that's a natural right. barrier. And if you see the location of the tumor, I mean, uh, it's quite away from the costochondral junction. So you've got adequate margin to go basically till the, I mean, uh, parasternal area. Right. Dr. Jain, what is your... Right, especially if the tumor is present posteriorly, you know, near the spine, <laughs> then uh, four centimeter margin may not be possible. Yes. So, so uh, here comes next question for the uh, students. Is there any role of intraop frozen section? When do you do it? Or uh, whether you do it or not? Sir, intraoperative frozen section may not be feasible for a rib tumor. Because they right. use like uh, because they uh, they have to do decalcification for the tumor, right. so that may be yes. a limitation. And right. uh, however, we right. can send the marrow specimen for frozen section. Okay, and also uh, if if a tumor is uh, posteriorly located, uh, four centimeter margins may not be possible. So so uh, if a tumor is present in a very critical uh, point, right, P critical location like posteriorly near the spine, then one might uh, opt for frozen section. Otherwise, it's not always necessary. And I think frozen section, if we think that the soft tissue margins anywhere mm -hmm. are compromised or dicey, probably that's one of the things that the frozen section might help you in, as Suganda pointed out, for bone, mm -hmm. it might not really be accurate. Mainly for soft tissue, I think. Absolutely. So next comes the most important question as far as chest wall resections go. Um, so you ended up having a third, fourth rib anterior defect once you excised your tumor with margins, measuring around eight by eight centimeter. So Rahul, you want to take that? What are your options for reconstruction? Uh, I would do the reject, uh, reconstruction uh, uh, because the defect size is more than five centimeter and uh, cover by any uh, muscular cutaneous or muscle flap over it. Okay, so Ganda. Uh, okay. Ma'am, since only two ribs are resected here, I may not prefer rigid reconstruction. And uh, if the lung function is good, then uh, no reconstruction may be required. And if, and if the lung function is compromised, then I may go for semi-rigid reconstruction. Dr. Shuganda, a question for you. The defect here is about eight by eight centimeter. It's quite huge. And uh, it's on the anterolateral uh, yes. phase of the chest. So, sir, for, prevention of of yeah. for prevention of lung herniation, I may go for semi-rigid reconstruction, mesh and followed by... What about uh, uh, paradoxical? Muscular reconstruction. What about flail chest? I mean, paradoxical movement. Because this is it's on the anterior chest wall where you've got maximum movement. Uh, sorry, sir, is it three and four, third and fourth rib or four ribs? Third and fourth, yeah. Two third ribs, and two ribs, ribs, yeah. two ribs eight by eight centimeters. Uh, but defect is eight by eight. Sir, what I, th matlab, I think uh, semi-rigid mesh may cover that. Yes, it, it, it does work, yes. Mm. Right, so reconstruction, I think reconstruction is mostly needed when there are more than two ribs, right, sir? Otherwise, if if two ribs are there, mesh is, I think, more than enough. Yes. Yeah. Right, right. Okay, uh, so I'm just going to delay a few questions that have come up on the chat box. And um, so, um, Rahul, since you've been quiet for a while now, so how many cores of uh, biopsy are the minimum? Five or six are sufficient. Right, so I think I, uh, so Bhushan says that on the chat box, but I think there is no fixed number as to how many minimum. I think if you think right. you've gotten adequate tissue, that should be it. Um, right. right, so the second question is, what if the disease is stable or progressive after new and chemotherapy? Do we still excise or chemo again? So Ganda, you mm -hmm. want to take that one? 
Ma'am, if it is stable, then we should go in for a surgery. But if it is progressive, then we may uh, give for a second line chemotherapy because the disease has not responded. Actually, that's an interesting question. I'd like the examiners to uh, also give their take on it in their experience. If it is chemo is responsive, it's a good uh, biological behavior. But if it's not responding, but if it's still localized. I mean, a second line regimen is not going to really going to uh, help in terms of, I mean, thing. So if it is resectable, we should go ahead and do a resection. Yeah, I absolutely agree with sir. Perfect. And uh, another question is, how do you decide the margins of resection? Uh, so is it on your pre-chemo volume or is it on your post-chemo volume? Because uh, the two of them are dramatically different. So Rahul, what's your take on that? And in this case, would the border of the sternum go or would you be conservative? Ma'am, uh, I, uh, uh, I would uh, like to do uh, resection on the basis of pre-operative, uh, oh, sorry, pre-chemo imaging. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, for a sternum, I would like to uh, see the margins. If, uh, if uh, a sternum is well away from the... Uh, Tumor and I can adequately take the margins and no need for the standard. Examiners, are you happy with that answer? Okay. Yeah, I mean, imaging yeah, I mean, might be straight away from the standard. So I think right. that suffices. Huh? Right. So, yes, I think you're right, Rahul. I mean, as in all cancers, we would try and get the pre chemo uh, bulk as your aim for resection. But I'm not sure with you know large evenings, this is always possible, but I that should probably be. The aim. Okay, so this patient uh, underwent resection, and um, in this case, eight by eight centimeter large anterior defect. Uh, he got reconstructed with a rigid recon with a bone cement uh, reconstruct, and this was the HPR, a residual viable even sarcoma, two percent residual treatment related changes in ninety eight percent. Bone and soft tissue margins are free. The closest is the inferior margin, which was one centimeter. So Rahul, your take, any adjuvant treatment in this case or is this patient done with all his therapy? No adjuvant treatment is required. Suganda? I'd like to give further courses of adjuvant chemotherapy. Right. Yeah. Are the examiners yes. okay with the answer? Yeah. Yes, yes, chemotherapy should be done. Adjuvant chemotherapy should be planned at. Absolutely. And uh, so this brings me to the question, Rahul, what are the, is there any indication for adjuvant radiation post-resection and even sarcoma? If the margins are positive, then radiation can be. So if margins are positive, would you want to attempt a reaccession or would you want to radiate? First, I would like to do reaccession, but mm -hmm. uh, if microscopic margins are positive, then radiate. All right. uh, or if it is not yeah. possible to uh, re resect then adjuvant radiation. Perfect. So I think if you have a positive margin, your first instinct would be to re resect the negative margins, but that may not okay. always be possible. Uh, okay. Dr. Jain, are you, uh, is that what you would do as well? Yes, yes, yes definitely. All right. And um, what if the chemo has worked wonders and there is no residual viable chemo in the specimen that you've excised? Would you still want to give chemotherapy? Mm -hmm. Complete the uh, course of the black eye resume. Yeah, I think I would um, agree with that. Examiners, I, would you agree with that as well? Yeah, you took complete the course of chemotherapy. Absolutely. Yeah, Evings has to be always treated aggressively, you know. It's it's a highly aggressive tumor we are dealing with. So, yes. Right. So, um, that brings us to the end of case one, where we discussed uh, about Ewing's sarcoma and its treatment mainly and reconstruction of anterior chest wall defects, which brings us to case two, which is a 42-year-old gentleman, good performance status, no comorbidities, and has a very slowly growing anterior chest wall swelling that he's actually noticed since three years. And, uh, and we have clinical photographs for this one. So, uh, Rahul, would you want to... Uh, Describe what you see. Man, uh, there is a uh, around the eight to seven centimeters swelling in the uh, anterior chest wall. Uh, from and uh, 
uh, it is a lobulated selling. Uh, skins appears to be involved. Uh, uh, it it, it uh, must be a hard selling. Uh, I cannot say comment on that. And uh, it is uh, extending uh, uh, from uh, the. Uh, um, uh, so Rahul, uh, made of the. Uh, Rahul, one question. Just by looking at the presentation, would you like to keep any differential diagnosis before doing anything? What would come in your mind? Uh, the first uh, uh, my diagnosis will be a. It can be a thymoma. Thymoma. Thymic carcinoma. Sorry, thymic carcinoma. Thymic carcinoma. Thymic carcinoma would going to come out like this. I think Doctor okay. Jain wants to look be... a little bit higher. <laughs> what else? It can be a. So, so, so uh, you would like to keep your first BD as thymic carcinoma, really? Why? So the uh, side. No, but but thymic is it is it is. I think this retrosternal down. Yeah, it's 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 in the mediastinum, right? First, you would want to think about some chest wall mass, right? Chest wall, some sarcoma. Hmm. You would straight away go inside and think about thymic carcinoma? Okay, Suganda? <laughs> Sir, by looking, they, either it can be a soft tissue sarcoma or a bone sarcoma arising from sternum, probably manubrium sternum. Yes. Right. Okay. So, how will you proceed? Sir, I'll proceed with imaging of a, a CCT neck and thorax. Mm. And after the imaging, I'll go for a core biopsy. Okay. And depending on the biopsy, I'll right. for yes. further work up for my metastatic work up. So, so there's a history of three years, right? It's it's clearly a very slow growing tumor. So based on that, uh, do you have anything in your mind? What it could be? <laughs> or you would just wait for the biopsy? Sir, it can be low grade tumor. Actually, it is visible on this slide. So it can yeah. call yeah, I, know it was... okay. I think okay. Sukanta, okay. if you could physically examine, you could get more idea about that. Yes, definitely. So uh, uh, one question. How, how do you uh, grade sarcomas? How important is the grade? Uh, sir, grade is very important because uh, uh, like in the latest AGCC definitions, they have also mm -hmm. uh, made it more important than the size. Like uh, yes. T4 grade 1 tumor is still stage 1, but uh, T, uh, like uh, grade 3 tumors, T1 is stage 2. No, I mean, so, uh, what, what, what factors uh, uh, make the score, scoring for the grading? So it is mito uh, mitosis per hyperfield. Only mitosis is there? Uh, mitosis and nuclear pleomorphism. No. Necrosis. Ne necrosis. Yes, tumor necrosis. Tumor. Right. So, so there are three things which they consider for 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 a grading score, right? <laughs> what are the what are those three things? One is necrosis. One is mitosis, and which is the third one? So differentiation. Yes, it's tumor differentiation. Right. So out of these three, they, they make a score and then they divide into G1, G2 and G3, yeah. right? Based on the score. Okay. Okay. So uh, Rahul, uh, what? How, how are you going to proceed? You have got a, a CT scan, a PET CT done. What are you going to choose? The CT thorax. Okay. Hmm. Okay. How will uh, CT thorax after knowing the diagnosis of a sarcoma or? So it is a low grade uh, chondro sarcoma. So hmm. usually they do not metastasize. Okay. Yes. Hmm. Okay. Good. So I'm going to throw in a question here actually. Um, so on imaging, if uh, let's get the imaging. 
Yeah. yeah. So this is the imaging of the patient. It's a CCD thorax, like you said, and it's clearly. Uh, could you diagnose this as a low-grade chondrosarc on imaging? Would you always want a biopsy? And there are arc calcifications or ring calcifications are present in the chondrosarcoma. Right. What's our examiner's yeah. take on this question? Yeah, I think uh, imaging I think biopsy, is, yes, should be done. I mean, in this case, yeah, especially, yeah. it's not so difficult to access. It's so easy right. to be accessed. So I, I don't think a diagnosis will uh, really delay the case. It's quite easily accessible. I mean, so we should get a tissue diagnosis. It gives us an idea yeah. about the grading. And yeah. Especially to rule out uh, other sarcomas like osteosarcoma yes. or even sarcoma, yes. where, where near joint has to be planned. So yes. I think it's better to go with biopsy first. Yes. Absolutely. Okay, yeah. right. So... Uh, Rahul, you want to read the scan? Um, this is an axial views of a CT scan of a thorax, uh, showing a, a large soft tissue mass in the anterior aspect of the thorax. Uh, it, uh, it, is show, uh, it, has, it is showing uh, multiple calcifications in it, and uh, it is eroding the sternum. And... Uh, uh, like okay. Dr. Dalong said the last time, do you want to uh, mention the extent of this tumor? Because in this case, it seems to be quite gigantic. Yes, yes. Yeah, you can be a little more elab elaborative, Rahul. Uh, like infiltration is there or not? Is it just hey. in the adjacent structures? See, ultimately, you have to plan a uh, section, right? So, uh, so just be a little more elaborative. So, uh, um, dorsally, it is involving the uh, media stenum. Yeah, on the image, you can see it's mainly arising from the sternum, and uh, it looks uh, like it's displacing your airways, uh, more of the pressure effect, not really infiltrating it. Right. Uh, actually, it is reaching up to the surface of a nominate, left yes. nominate. Yes. Mm. Mm. That's huge. <laughs> right. So, which brings me to my next question. Uh, so, Ganda, on what you see on the scan, what do you anticipate your excision to be like? What all structures do you think you're going to end up removing? Uh, Ma'am, I'll end up removing the uh, manubrium sternum, uh, sterni along with the proximal half of uh, uh, sternal body with the, both the sternoclavicular joints and uh, the uh, adjacent uh, costal cartilages. Right. Examiners, uh, are you happy yes. with that answer? Yes. Yes. It involves removing basically the upper part of the medium china with both the joints, but you do definitely do have that lower part, the costal, uh, subcostal, zephoid part of the <coughs> chest wall for uh, stability. Right. Absolutely. Uh, any role of lymphadenectomy while operating for a low grade chondrosac, Rahul? Ma'am, uh, if it is visible on the uh... Be operative amazing, then uh, we can go for lymphadenectomy. Otherwise, there is no rope. Okay. Mm. Okay. So uh, this is what the defect look like. Uh, yeah. Before actually, would you want to keep your plastic surgery colleagues informed about this case, or would you feel that you will get away without? They should be informed. Yeah, I think uh, we let the cat out of the bag okay. a little bit too soon. Yeah. Um, Right, so Suganda, this is, sorry, the extent of the excision, this is all that you have excised on table. So what's your plan of reconstruction going to be in this case? Um, my plan of reconstruction will be a rigid reconstruction. So either the sandwich mesh uh, with the uh, methyl methacrylate bone cement uh, for the sternal part. And uh, then I'll, uh, I want to cover it with the uh, uh, musculocutaneous flap. Examiners, okay. any questions on this? Uh, 
so yeah. what are the different ways by which you can reconstruct this tell me all the options and which one will be your preferred option suganda hello am i audible yes yes you are audible suganda uh, sorry sir my internet connection ah, on okay so I, i was i was just asking what are the different options uh, available for for the reconstruction and what would you prefer yeah suganda so specifically regarding implants i mean this is a huge defect so what implants are you looking for basically metal, metallic implants uh, sir uh, metallic implants for the sternum sir actually i missed the whole point sorry for that yes. because you have taken the whole of the sternum and yes, bilateral uh, clavicles yes sir sir uh, titanium plates can be used and uh, mm. then uh, meshes can be used although it is not involving the ribs otherwise osteosynthesis systems are a new uh, new uh, like uh, options available and okay. then flap covers okay Rahul, anything you want to add to this, or are you happy with this? And customize the three D printed uh, sternal plates can be used. Customize. Yeah, three D printed can be done, but it's it's cost is the main factor yeah. here, right? Cost is the problem, and uh, it okay. takes time for. Uh, sir, so one question to sir: Do you use three D printed uh, reconstruction there, sir? How long, sir? Yeah, yeah, no, I'm not using three D printed, but uh, we do have. I um, mean, people are doing it now. Right, right. That yeah, it's a wonderful option. Yes, but, but the yes. cost is the only. The cost only is the main factor. factor. I mean, they take yeah, time to deliver right. it to you, so the main thing is yeah. the cost. Right. Uh, and also, uh, so in your experience, uh, with a three D printed thing, doesn't it kind of limit the flexibility of the extent of excision? I mean, would that be a cause of concern? Uh, because when you're using a three D, you have to plan basically where you're resecting the margins. Everything has to be planned. I mean, pre-op right. from the CT right. imaging. because they make your implant based on the 3d one of your uh, imaging but i feel i mean for sternal resection and all this uh, a 3d implant would definitely be more advantageous right and also cosmetically more yes uh, much better so much better in terms of functional right. and cosmetic also right okay so i've just been told that we have another 15 minutes for discussion so let's get to the complications a little bit here Um, yeah. So this patient was a slightly obese patient. Um, in, I forgot to mention that in the case scenario. And once we did this enormous excision and reconstruction, we found that we couldn't really extubate this patient on table. Uh, so he was shifted on ventilatory support and slowly weaned off the ventilator. But he was dyspneic and unable to maintain saturation on spontaneous yeah. ventilation. Mm -hmm. So what could be the possible reasons in this case? Uh, yeah, Rahul. 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 Mm. So there can be a frail chest. Okay. Good. Yeah. Mm hmm. So I think that is the most important thing. Most, which one I think, yeah, do. that's the most important because I mean, uh, when you do sternal resection, mm. that is these are things where you definitely need some form of uh, osteosynthesis. Right. Rigid. rigid. Yeah, rigid. Absolutely, sir. So coming to flail chest, Suganda, uh, what's the clinical picture like? What are your clinical findings when you suspect flail chest in this kind of a reconstruction? Uh, Ma'am, uh, the clinical findings will be patient will be dyspneic and uh, uh, will be have will be having labored breathing, and uh, since it is sternal uh, as part, <coughs> then there may not be paradoxical respiratory movement that we used to see in the uh, resection of ribs. uh so clinically like on examination there will be a uh, difficulty in chest movement like the uh, when we see the chest rise in normal respiration so that may be difficult for the person who is having flail chest reconstructed and rahul how do you diagnose a flail chest is there anything you do it is mainly a clinical diagnosis Yeah, you see a uh, paradox in the movement of respiration, basically. Right. Rahul. 
right mm-hmm. so these are just a list of things that probably could go wrong and clinically this patient did have a failing of the rigid reconstruct he was taken up so um, any role of conservative management in a frail segment Uh, ma'am, uh, their uh, positive pressure ventilation can be tried uh, before the accident, uh, before the uh, surgery. Uh, if it is uh, patient is not improving on the positive pressure ventilation, then definitely the uh, resurgery should be done. Right, you're right. So especially in this case with a central defect like that, even we felt that oh. probably refixing this would be a better option, and that is what was. done and mm-hmm. he was slowly weaned off even after this probably the obesity and the extent of excision contributing to his uh, delayed sort of recovery from the surgery so as expected like the biopsy the histopath was a chondrosarcoma low grade with negative margins uh, any role of adjuvant treatment suganda so, large tumor ma'am i would like to keep the patient in follow up and uh... not because chondrosarcomas are chemo resistant and i don't want to give radiotherapy to the patient so i'd like to keep the patient in follow up examiner mm. is happy yeah, with the answer yeah absolutely yeah. yeah grade 1 tumor chondrosarcoma mm. i mean no medical oncologist would be ready to give her chemotherapy <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah right so quickly moving on to case 3 a uh, 20 year old gentleman epoc 0 no comorbidities uh, right chest wall swelling since 8 months again a heart swelling over the right anterior lateral chest wall overlying skin normal and this is the imaging um so rahul quickly again and this is axial view of the ct scan of the thorax uh, showing a large uh, soft tissue mass lesion in the uh, right anterior lateral aspect uh, with the calcification uh, in it uh, it has a intrathoracic extension as well and uh, mm-hmm. uh it uh, lesion is awaiting the liver as well yeah it's not just awaiting it is uh, it is inventing uh, yes. upon the liver uh, it is displeasing it yeah shifting it towards the left and, and and even it it is reaching up to the ivc the surface of ivc also yeah right rahul yes hmm okay uh so these are the things that we've already discussed uh, in the previous cases uh, this patient underwent a biopsy came out to be a chondrosarcoma the staging workup was done underwent surgery and like we predicted on the scan required a wedge of the lung like rahul you said it had a significant intrathoracic extension and a part of the diaphragm also had to be mm. resected uh so reconstruction here uh, suganda quickly what would be your choice like a rapid fire quick pick ma'am in this case i'll uh, go for a rigid reconstruction and okay. uh, or the osteosynthesis system for the ribs rahul do you agree with her yes ma'am uh, rigid uh, reconstruction should be done and uh, also the reconstruction of the diaphragm as well yes ma'am. okay how will you reconstruct diaphragm uh, with the uh, bicral mesh we can reconstruct okay Well, I'd like to know the extent of uh, diaphragm resected. Partial. So, say half the hemi diaphragm. Hmm. Mam, uh, proline mesh. I would like to use. Hmm. Examiners. Okay. Yes, proline yeah, mesh okay. can be used. I mean, right. that's on the right side. Right. We do use proline hmm. on the right side, not the right. on the left side. Yeah. Right. So Rahul, why did Sir say proline mesh on the right side and wouldn't be so happy using proline on the left? Uh, Ma'am, uh, the proline mesh causes uh, erosion of the nearby uh, structures, like heart uh, pericardium in a case of uh, left side. So Ganda, you think there's any other reason for this difference between right and left? uh mam the abdominal part like uh, on the left uh, the right side there is liver do- uh, in the abdomen and on the right side there can the stomach the small intestine can also uh, go up since the planes have been uh, like uh, divided so that may be long due was that was that the answer you were looking for in terms of absorbability which one is absorbable 
vicryl mesh is absorbable yes that's the reason why you use the vicryl mesh on the left side because if it is not absorbable in our time it can go and erode that's what we fear yeah. in any in any abdominal wall hernia you must have seen we don't use any uh, non absorbable mesh it's always absorbable mesh towards the bowel and uh, non absorbable mesh away from the bowel yes yeah absolutely so like the previous case this came as a chondrosarc low grade negative margin kept under observation now i have a slight twist in this case uh with the same imaging findings suppose we did a biopsy and it came out to be a chest wall osteogenic sarcoma what would you like to do rahul would it change what you have done in this case the role of new adjuvant therapy in osteosarcoma is controversial although many students prefer to give new adjuvant uh, chemotherapy followed by surgery okay suganda so any difference of opinion ma'am i would like to give new adjuvant chemotherapy if the this was osteosarcoma as osteosarcoma is known to hmm. be metastatic either synchronous or at a later stage and uh, so i would prefer to give chemotherapy first so even if this is a non metastatic resectable at presentation but large ogs of the chest wall you feel that it should be any yes ma'am yes all right so, uh, rahul one thing i'll agree with you there is very little evidence in this regard so i'm yeah. going to take this to our examiners for their <laughs> opinion yeah i think they when it's right i mean if it was a small tumor osteosarcoma i mean there is nothing like uh, i mean the chest wall osteosarcoma is different from those in the extremities because they are very rare in the flat bones like in the ribs and all that but mm -hmm. seeing this size if it was also sarcoma i mean i yeah. think because of the size i think a form of uh, some form of near given chemotherapy would definitely be i mean uh, helpful i think right sir and also to deal with the micro micro metastasis yes if, yes, yes because of the size huh? definitely chemo should be the option first so to summarize point well taken that if it's a osteosarcoma chest wall osteosarcoma is first of all very rare limited evidence but if small tumors clearly up front resectable then surgery uh, is the way to go but if not and if it's a tumor like this which involves a lot of like a big resection a lot of morbidity then probably nct would be you wouldn't be wrong in saying yeah. that okay so let's come to the complication in this case the patient did well chondrosarc no adjuvant therapy went home and after a couple of years he presented with pus draining from the previous incision site and a persistent cough with positional variation so i will don't look at the second part of the slide on this part of the info tell me what do you suspect remember that you taken a lung wedge during the course of the surgery um uh, there can be a bronchopleural uh, fistula in this patient uh, right. which has developed the empyema right okay so your suspicions are correctly spot on because on examination mm. there was a constant stream of pus from the skin and with amount of bubbling when the patient coughed and the clinical impression was an infected prosthesis with an underlying bronchopleural fistula so um this was what the imaging showed it was really quite ghastly actually um, i'm not going to ask you to describe it because it's horrendous and i don't think any surgeon would want to see this but this is what it showed so what's the plan So Ganga, you want to take that one? Ma'am, um, uh, first I would like to start the course of antibiotic for the patient, and uh, uh, with with culture or without culture? with with culture, sir. Okay, so you wait for culture. Okay, right. Next. Then. Hello. I it will actually. i like to uh, incorporate the uh, like uh, the uh, not see uh, what i can say the uh, respiratory physician into account and uh, i can ask uh, help from there also for the uh, managing the further treatment okay. and uh, that suganda do you think in uh, some form of back therapy is going to help in this yes sir Would yes sir try? back therapy may help this patient So, I mean, and see, see, you are seeing pus trickling coming out from the incision, right? Yes. Uh, and the wound is still not open. So, would you like to open the wound first? 
let let a pus drain out further yes, yes. yeah would you, would you not like yeah. to open open the wound first that's what we do that. i would not like to open the wound i may go for a chest drain insertion and uh, okay. to drain the empyema but not mm. opening of the wound would not, not be would not be my like further plan rahul any difference in your opinion um, uh, since there is a perforated cavity so i would uh, like to go uh, thorac i will do the thoracotomy and uh, drainage of the pus With closure of the bronchopleural fistula and uh, covering with any muscle flap. Okay. So examiners, two different answers. I think. <laughs> I mean, this is a very difficult situation. Absolutely. Yeah, because nothing is really right or wrong. What we need to do is that basically the pus needs to be evacuated. We have to drain that yeah. side first. Mm-hmm. I mean, the basic principle is to drain that side, whether right. it's right. surgically right. under uh, ultrasound guidance or CT guidance. whatever technique you have but it needs to be drained out first and then you can really start thinking how you're going to approach it so right the for, as yeah. sir said most important pus anywhere in the body needs to be drained and it couldn't be more true for a situation like this especially when you have a prosthesis inside which also yeah. apparently seems to be infected yeah. so at some point yeah. in time once the patient is stable you will have to form a more definitive plan about removing this infected prosthesis what is this yeah so um my last question and i leave it the uh, to the examiners for the rest of the questions is in an infected field like this you go in you remove the infected mesh and cement and now you have a grossly infected field you've given your washes what is your choice of reconstruction now in an infected field i think in the infected field i would not do any reconstruction i mean the main aim is would be would be a drainage here and uh, uh i think i think uh, immediate reconstruction uh, uh, should not be done here yes as it was so infected yes. so uh, we can delay the reconstruction a little, little bit definitely the infection mm-hmm. and everything pass subsides yeah then then in the meantime as sir mentioned we can put the patient on vac also yes and so, if we go for surgery it will be basically making a pleural window in that particular yeah. side so it's going to be a thoracostoma basically yes and we have just have to wait for it to have a kyphoplasty like i mean thoracoplasty like later on right in the apex yeah. absolutely so that brings me to the end of my cases and my slide set and uh, i'd like to leave the floor open to both our examiners in case they have any more questions for our examiners uh, i would like to ask uh, dr suvanda uh, how many chest wall reconstruction have you seen i mean so based on it we can ask you some questions practically okay, she is muted dr rahul can take the question i think yes sir there are two or three reconstructions i have seen okay so most of the times you are basically using some form of uh, implants and mesh to mesh the uh, most of the mesh uh, was a uh, place but uh, one time a steel wire uh, rib was reconstructed new rib construction was done using the uh, steel rib the steel uh, bias okay so have you think all chest wall needs to be reconstructed any chest wall resection all needs to be reconstructed all of them no sir uh, uh, if the defect size is small uh, but uh, one or two ribs has been excised and mm. uh, if it is uh, behind the scapula and the uh, defect size is small then okay yeah. okay so uh, what what defects are more likely to cause flail chest the upper ones or the uh, those in the lower ribs lower ribs right okay so have you used titanium plates both of you have you ever seen it uh, what 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 makes titanium the preferred choice for uh, reconstruction so it is a lightweight uh, it is inert and uh, they are uh, uh, they uh, does not interfere with the post operative imaging as well what else they are resistant to corrosion right they are biocompatible okay
So I think we'll be safe in saying both Rahul and Suganda. I, I think y'all did an absolutely fantastic job, and um, I you're on the right way for as uh, far as your exams go. Examiners, would you agree with me? Oh yes, definitely. They they perform well, <laughs> and and the, the cases you had selected were not, not so so easy. Not, right? not simple. They were quite complex. <laughs> yeah, they were. Yeah. They were. And uh, I'd like to say a big thank you to the examiners as well because I think the discussion was uh, absolutely fantastic. I came off learning so many things from this, and thank you so much. And and I, I also want to thank the entire uh, team of IISO for yeah. having me for this. This was my first time, and I really enjoyed it. And I'm really looking forward to conducting uh, such mock exams later on. Also. So we are uh, looking forward to you staying till the end because we'll be having a Q and A session with all the three examiners at the end of this uh, webinar. Oh, so uh, uh, where the examiners become the examinees. Uh, we now request uh, our chairperson, Dr. Uh, Raman Deshpande, sir, to kindly give uh, his remarks on the uh, discussion that has happened. I think this is an excellent way. of evaluating the overall knowledge see uh, <clears throat> there used to be a time when people used to ask questions to find out <clears throat> what you don't know but i think this uh, way was a very very positive one as to what actually people know and um, i think uh, it has been established by both the uh, the uh, moderator as well as both the examiners that rahul as well as suganda know adequately to be passed so that's very good Thank i think that, that's a uh, bigger smile bigger smile now sukanda come on <laughs> good there are any congratulations for by for wrestling out fantastic cases and if i'm not mistaken i think one of these cases i was there in your theater yes sir you were <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay so that that's very nice and uh, darlong of course brings a very very rich experience in uh, chest wall tumors uh, re reconstruction so uh, thank you very much uh, very very wonderful rather than going totally theoretically it's a very very practical kind of an approach congratulations and keep it up thank you thank you thank you so thank much you. sir thank you uh, our next segment would uh, be the statistics segment after which we'll come to the expert talk by dr dalong so uh, the, the ones who have attended the previous one we covered the basics of survival curve part 1 which was delivered by dr central rajapa two weeks back uh, today he will be continuing the same talk uh, there will be a small revision in the beginning so even if you have joined in today for the first time please uh, listen to the next 15 minutes uh, uh, with full attention uh, here is dr central rajapa with capital my curve part 2 good evening and welcome to part 2 of kaplan meyer survival curve lecture so let's do a quick recap of where we left last week so the kaplan meyer survival curve is used in order to measure the magnitude of benefit between two interventions so in the kaplan meyer curve that you're seeing in front of you this is comparing two treatments for advanced lung cancer Good evening and welcome to a quick recap of where we left last week. So the Captain Meyer survival curve is used in order to measure the magnitude of benefit between two interventions. So in the Captain Meyer curve that you're seeing in front of you, this is comparing two treatments for advanced lung cancer. So there are many parameters that you use to measure the magnitude of benefit. So the most common one that we refer to is the median progression free survival. The second one that you refer to is the progression free survival rate at a particular time point. Now this time point could be 12 months, 24 months. This is also called as a landmark analysis to say 
that at a particular point in time, what percentage of patients are progression free in one arm compared to the other arm. But the most appropriate one that you have to remember as the measure for magnitude of benefit is the hazard ratio. The hazard ratio here is 0.59. Now, 0.59 hazard ratio denotes that there is a 41% risk reduction for progression if you took decomitinib compared to jefitinib. Now, how did you get to this 41%? It is 1 minus 0 0.59 into 100, right? So that's how you got to this figure of 41% risk reduction. Now, remember, we left you last week with a question, which of these measures are you supposed to choose in order to describe the magnitude of benefit? And the answer to that question, or should I say the most appropriate answer to that question is hazard ratio. Now, why is this the most appropriate one? Because the hazard ratio is constant irrespective of where in which time point you are measuring it. It doesn't matter whether you're measuring it at six months, 12 months, 18 months, or 30 months. So you are talking about what is referred to as a proportional hazard, right? Which means that any point in time on the curve, the hazard ratio is constant. But what is the problem with using hazard ratio? It assumes that the hazard is likely to be proportional, which means it is constant. Now, how did you come to this constant hazard ratio? That is something that the software will do. It will do multiple calculations, calculating the hazard ratio at various points in this curve or this comparison and give you the average, which is likely to be constant over time. The second important point one needs to keep in mind is that this is relative. Now, what is relative? Let's say you're talking about a hazard ratio of 0.5, which means there is a 50% risk reduction. Now, the baseline risk is extremely important. Why is this important? Let us say that an intervention brings down the risk of an event from 2% to 1%. Now, that's a 50% risk reduction. Let's say an intervention brings down the risk of an event from 50% to 25%. So it's an absolute 25% decrease in the likelihood of the event happening. Now, when you talk about clinical significance, two coming down to one or a 50% risk reduction of 2% being 1% is not clinically significant. While if you have a baseline risk that is 50% and that comes down by an absolute measure of 25%, that is highly clinically significant. So though you will say that the hazard ratio is constant along this curve, it is important to remember that is, this is relative. And it's important to consider the baseline risk when you're talking about hazard ratio. The higher the baseline risk of having an event the better is hazard ratio as a measure of the magnitude of benefits. Now look at these curves. Let's look at why the median may not actually tell you the whole story. This is a curve on the top left that is showing you the benefit of bevacizumab in advanced ovarian cancer. Now look at this. When you look at the median, these curves are nicely separating. They're as if the curve separated for the sake of the sponsor or the trial or the drug. What happens afterwards? The curves come together. Now, if you said median progression-free survival here, that would have been significant and clinically significant. But look at what happens. Over time, the curves come together, which means that the median progression-free survival here is not an appropriate measure because it's not telling you what happens afterwards. The same is the, is, is the curve at the bottom. This is again Bevacizumab. Again, you see that the median is significant or there is space between these two curves when it comes to that median progression-free survival. But look at what happens over time. All these comes together. But what's the advantage of measuring median progression-free survival? It's very easy to tell your patients and make them understand. But what are the problems? The problem is that 
the median progression free survival or the median overall survival is being measured at one point and this is not telling you the whole story right this could be a by chance effect because you're just measuring it at one point during this curve so that is one of the disadvantages with median progression free survival or overall survival as the measure of magnitude of benefit now this is again another curve comparing two treatments look at what the median is it's 11 months versus 10.9 months but look at it it's statistically significant because the p value is less than 0 0.05 this is 0 0.01 here and the hazard ratio is 74 0.74 which means there is a 26% risk reduction of the event happening. So both are significant. The p-value and the hazard, that's clinically significant. But look at the median. It's better by 0.1 months on a fatinib compared to gefitinib. Now, that's not clinically significant. So again, here is an example of why the median may not tell you the whole story. But here, the landmark event becomes very important or the landmark analysis becomes very important. So look at what happens at month 18 and month 24. You clearly see that roughly around 10% more patients are event free on the efatinib arm compared to the gefitinib arm. So in certain situations, the magnitude of benefit might be better indicated by the landmark analysis rather than using just the median. The other reason why we tend to use landmark analysis in certain types of treatments, and here you're seeing the benefit of an immune checkpoint inhibitor, is to look at what happens to the curve over time. Does it plateau? Do patients stop having the event that you're looking for? Because these are patients who are likely to have long-term benefits because with any intervention, especially in advanced disease, you're trying to see if you can cure your patient. So if your curve is plateauing at some point in time, then you can say, if you reach this point without an event, then your likelihood of having an event beyond that point is very small or nil. So again, landmark analysis becomes very important when you're talking of long-term benefits or plateauing of the curve denoting those long-term benefits. So median may not tell you the whole story. In some situations, landmark analysis is very, very relevant. So the answer to the question that we started with is that the most appropriate parameter to use is the hazard ratio. But there may be situations where you might want to use median progression-free survival or the median overall survival as an indicator, or some situations where you more want to use landmark analysis as the indicator of the magnitude of benefit. Now, I'm showing you this curve here to get a different connotation in terms of how you read the Kaplan-Meier curve. Now, this is a very old study. This is the HERA study looking at the benefit of trastuzumab over placebo plus chemotherapy. Now, this is trastuzumab plus chemotherapy in one arm, placebo plus chemotherapy in the other arm, right? Now, there are three curves here. The two curves on the top, the dark blue one and the red one are trastuzumab for one year and two years. You clearly see that these curves are sitting on top of each other, which means there is no benefit for extended period of trastuzumab. But what I'm interested in looking at is the space between the blue curve or the light blue curve at the bottom and the top two curves. Now, what does this curve really tell you? Now, look at this. At the end of 10 years, 62% of patients who did not take trastuzumab. That means these patients took only chemotherapy are event-free. Okay? 62% of patients who took only chemotherapy are event-free. Come to the top. At the end of 10 years, 68% of patients who took trastuzumab plus chemotherapy are event-free. Okay? So, the 62% at the bottom, did not need trastuzumab to be event-free. The curve, the curve above and the, and the 
people above that curve, which means that if you're taking 100% as the number of patients who started on this, then 100 minus 68, which is 32% of patients need something that's more than trastuzumab. That means these are patients who don't get cured in spite of trastuzumab. So who are those patients who actually benefit from trastuzumab? These are patients who are lying between the 68 and 62, which means about 6% of patients are the only ones who are benefiting from trastuzumab. Okay, so 62%, that's the blue curve, don't need this intervention. About 32% don't benefit from this intervention because they still need something more because they're <coughs> recurring in spite of this intervention. There's a small group of patients, 6% in between, who are actually benefiting from this intervention. So this is another way of interpreting a Kaplan-Meier curve. And this also takes us to this parameter called the number needed to treat. Okay. So the number needed to treat is the number of patients that you have to treat for one patient to benefit. So here it is 6. So how do you do that? It's 100 by 6. That's about 15. So for every 15 patients who have this intervention, one patient is likely to benefit. So this is another important number that one needs to remember when you're talking about magnitude of benefit. And finally, we come to the significance of the benefit. Now, remember that statistical significance is not equal to clinical significance. And this curve is a classic example of that. Now, this is the addition of pertuzumab to trastuzumab in patients with early breast cancer in the adjuvant setting. Now, the hazard ratio is 0.81, which means there's a 19% benefit. The p-value is significant, and the absolute benefit is 1.7%. So if you ask me, this is a statistically significant result, but it is not a clinically significant result. So remember that the magnitude of benefit might be statistically significant, but it need not necessarily be clinically significant. So how should an ideal curve look like? So an ideal curve, which means an ideal curve that is giving you benefit should have early separation. That means they should start separating very early during the course of the trial. There should be widely spaced, which means you should be able to drive a plane or a car in between the curves and they should be divergent, not like our bevacizumab curves, which were coming together after the median. And the intervention should be a winner, irrespective of whether you're using the hazard ratio, the landmark analysis, or the median as a measure of benefit. With that, we will come to the end of this lecture. I hope you didn't get confused by listening to the many numbers and parameters that I spoke about. If there are any doubts, I'll be more than happy to answer them during the course of the discussion time. Thanks so much for that very patient here. We thank uh, Dr. Sentil for his effort uh, into getting this together. We now come to our next part of this webinar. We invite uh, Dr. Darlong to kindly deliver his expert talk on the controversial and contemporary management of chest wall tumors. One, one, one minute. That's fine, sir. In the meanwhile, I'll invite the other examiners to yes. go through the chat box and uh, answer the queries which remain uh, to be answered. Over to you, Dolan, sir. Is it visible now on the screen? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, ISO team, uh, for having me here and uh, the opportunity to speak on chest wall tumor, a, a rather very rare tumor and uh, very many forms of managing it. So I'll be basically trying to go 
into basically what is the really in the world uh, scenario in real world and what we are doing basically, which is more, uh, which can be easily reproducible and can be done by almost anybody. So just an introduction. It can be a, a benign or malignant disease that's basically for the chest wall. It can be a primary tumor, it can be metastatic, or it can be because of local invasion by adjacent uh, tumors, like from the lung, mediastinum, or the breast, or the pleura. And uh, if you see as such the primary malignant chest wall tumor, that's PMCWT, it represents just a minuscule, less than 1% of all the malignant tumor. So this is really a very, very, in nutshell, a very, very small component because of which there will be many controversies regarding its optimal management, how you manage, how you treat. So we cannot have a definite answer. This is the correct way or uh, this is the right way. So we need to have some consensus. And uh, most of the case series are basically from institutional and not really a good case number. If we see as such, the most common is the sarcoma. And that in that case is basically controlled sarcoma, which is basically a surgical disease. It's not a medical, uh, it's a chemo resistant, radio resistant, and it's basically mainly surgical treatment. So that's the importance of surgery in these very rare minuscule tumors. And if you see a 5% of all uh, thorac thoracic malignancies, uh, it, that's what it represents, the chest wall tumor. It's just about 5% of all thoracic malignancies. And about 50% of the chest wall tumors are malignant. And from the basic investigation, X-ray will see we can see in about 20%, that's basically more like a screening. And we will definitely require some form of other better imaging that's basically the multi-slice CT scan. That's, that's uh, going to be more optimal for the visualizing the bones, the muscles, bezels, and most importantly, to get a 3D reconstruction, uh, which is very, very important in terms of recon when you're doing a more ma uh, major dissection. MRI is supposed to be superior in terms of uh, it's able to give contrast to soft tissue, but uh, it is more comfortable to use MRI in the limbs, upper limbs and lower limbs. But in the chest, it's the CT scan, which uh, usually scores more unless you're going towards the apex of the chest or towards the thoracic inlet. So MRI can also be used, but mainly it's the multi size CT chest that we use. In terms of PET scan, as we have talked about it, it is a very rare tumor. So it is not routinely used for most of the chest wall tumor, but definitely for a more aggressive tumor like sarcomas, it should, we should try and uh, use it most of the time because it gives us an idea about staging, about response evaluation, and for detection of recurrence. Coming to the management part, surgery is the mainstay of treatment. And when you do surgery, it involves wide resection. We are not really having a consistent on the adequate margin two centimeter, four centimeter, or just an R0. So in this process, we need to have a free margin of normal tissue, which entails that we will be exercising a lot of the ribs, uh, the muscles or the soft tissue component, and uh, sometimes the diaphragm, pericardium. So this involves extensive loss of soft tissue uh, in terms of bones or soft tissue cover. And this alters the respiratory dynamics and that's basically very important in terms of the ABC, airway, breathing, and circulation. So airway and breathing, this part also has an alteration. So in any chest wall tumor, reconstruction is a very, very, definitely very, very important part of it. It's basically the core success of any chest wall tumor uh, excision will be basically how you re reconstruct and retain these dynamics in terms of uh, physiology of the chest wall. This is just a classification of the chest wall malignancy, osseous group and the soft tissue malignancy. I will not go into in this detail because this is available in all the books. We all know about it. So for any chest wall uh, reconstruction, uh, first we need to see that the chest wall provides the integrity and stability for uh, cardiopulmonary function. It protects the intrathoracic organs and definitely it gives about the respiratory movement, which makes us breathe. So the goal of any reconstruction is to restore this uh, integrity, which is loss. Uh, that's the integrity plus stability to protect the internal organs and preserve the respiratory movements. And of course, we need to obliterate that space because if we have that space, you can have collection 
and collection is basically an idus for infection, which we don't want in a, uh, any surgery. Chest wall reconstruction is truly one of those uh, branch in surgery where it is basically multidisciplinary. You got the primary team, that's a surgical oncologist or thoracic team. And we need to have a very good reconstructive or a plastic surgical team with whom we are very much comfortable. I mean, we should plan upfront key. This is what we want from the beginning. And of course, we also need spine surgeons because as we approach more medially towards the spine, in some cases, we might need to take some part of, part of the vertebra also. And uh, with such major surgeries, it's important that post-op care is also very good in terms of critical care as well as rehabilitation. So these are the basic backbones of doing a good chest wall resection, the major complex ones. And the reconstruction part, it basically involves the skeletal component and the soft tissue component. So if you look at what are the strategies for uh, treating chest wall tumors, uh, this is what should be an ideal prosthetic material. Excuse me. It should be rigid. That is, it should be able to abolish any paradoxical movement. It should be malleable. That is, it should be able to control to the configuration of the chest wall. It should be inert and it should be radio resistant so you can do some imaging. And it should also allow tissue in growth. It should be sterile, resistant to infection. And of course, cost is very important. It should not be the limiting factor. So if you see all these factors, there's not even a single ideal material to choose from. So because of this region in terms of cost, availability, and all these things, the choice of material becomes very empirical, empirical depending on the surgeon, experience of the surgeon, availability of the implants. And of, out of all of this, there is no definite evidence to say that this uh, implant or this technique is much better than the other technique because we do not have so much of cases. So traditionally, these are the techniques that we've been doing it using rigid synthetic uh, materials like methyl, methacrylate, and flexible synthetic mesh like polyglactin, nylon, PTFE, silastics, and silicon. And these are the, again the modern techniques. It's what you call osteosynthetic materials. These are basically metallic materials, and they are very helpful in bridging the uh, bridging the ribs as well as the sternal defects. And this allows more physiological rib movements when they are combined with mesh and muscles. This is just to show what we have in India. This is the matrix rib. It is available in India. Uh, the only limiting factor is basically the cost. It's uh, you have to count basically in terms of the implant, one implant, and how many screws you're using. Because each screw, again, costs, the implant is, the plate costs you about eight to 10,000, and each screw is going to cost at least around four to 5,000. And it's imperative that on one side, at least two to three screws are placed on either ribs, rib, so as to maintain stability. So the cost goes up very high. Again, the, the drawbacks about these implants are that uh, besides the cost and availability, you can see that, I mean, it has been seen that in about 44% of cases, there's a failure at the end of one year in terms of fracture because they are rigid, so they tend to fracture at that side. And they could be, because you're using screws, they could be mismatched into a screw and a rib thickness resulting in dislocation. Or because of excessive drilling, there could be a loose screw in that particular side leading to dislocation. These are bone grafts. We don't have exactly in India. I have not used it. So we can have rib autologous, tissue banks, sternum, iliac. These are available in some specific centers, like in Greek. In Greek, they use a lot of uh, tissue banks for sternum. And these are the biological matrices. This is just to, uh, for the sake of presentation, but we do not have this, I mean, uh, uh, um, biological devices here in India, they are SLR matrix like Permacol, Protexa. They are more physiological. They allow more tissue in growth in them. But we do not have this in uh, India. And this is again a, a new technique now that we are uh, entering 3D printing, which is more common mainly in orthopedics. And this is, these are the 3D printing. You can see here, this is involving almost the whole of the hemisternum and uh, all, almost the whole of the rip on one side. So this is the ideal case where a deconstruction using a 3D printing technique will be helpful. 
And of course, this is the Anatomics, that's basically Australian based company, where the printer itself costs about three crores. And these are good, ideal, basically, when you are doing a sterile resection, all of the sterling exercise, but the limiting factor is basically the cost and availability. And in India, too, we have, have a company called 3D Incredible, which is based at Pune, and they are uh, basically making uh, 3D implants, customized implants, titanium based. And I'm sure I think we all will be using this sometime later on in the future, uh, since we have it locally now. And I think also be using it very soon. In terms of soft tissue reconstruction, this is basically a domain where you need to involve a plastic surgeons. We might be able to do a few of the uh, LD flaps or practice major flaps, but more other complex uh, flaps, we need to involve plastic surgeons because, I mean, uh, this is really, really important to have a good soft tissue cover uh, and integrity of the wound is important so as not to have any post-op respiratory complications. So a plastic surgeon involvement is very, very much crucial when you're doing major chest wall resection. So the practice worldwide, if we see as such, I'll just be going through three, four cases. You can see here in this uh, image, there's a tumor here basically in the anterior chest wall, just like the one Dr. Devyani presented today. You can see here, they have just excised the tumor involving uh, maybe around two, three ribs. They've excised. There's a big defect. It, it is more than five centimeters, I can see. And they just put a proline mesh here. They've just approximated proline mesh over there. This is the specimen. You can see one, two, and maybe a third rib here. So, so that's how they constructed this. I um, mean, they just put a proline mesh and then just covered it. They have not used any cement or anything like that. And it worked perfectly for uh, this group of patients. Again, if you see here, almost similar case, but uh, more laterally. Again, in this case, again, they've excised the whole area and they've used a proline mesh and then they've used methyl methacrylate cement over it and they've closed the wood primarily. So again, in this case, almost the same uh, chest wall tumor, and, uh, but close in a different way, giving the same result. And again, almost the same tumor, the same thing can be again, uh, has been managed using a titanium plate. And then over that, they put a mesh. So these are basically achieving the same result in most of the cases, uh, when they are away from the sternum, mostly on the anterior lateral chest wall, with a different technique and getting the same result. Uh, this is basically an image of the Strato system. We don't have the Strato system in India. It's basically from the French company. Uh, so this is basically an uh, image showing where the sternum is in excise. They put a proline mesh. And over that, they put a Strato's mesh, basically bridging the two ribs from the right and left, and then covered it with a muscle flap. So if you see as such, there is a wide variation in the techniques in terms of reconstruction uh, based on the location, whether it's a ribs, sternum, or spine, and available processes. So there are no standard guidelines to say that this is the best way and uh, this is the correct way to approach. It's basically, if we get a good result with whatever technique, I think that's what, uh, and a good arterial resection if we're able to perform and give a good quality of life, that's what we need to achieve. So looking this, in, this into factor at RGCI, we thought about affordability, something available. And uh, with this, if you see the number five sternal wire, that's basically the wire which, which is used in sternotomy. It has been used for decades and decades, and it's very, very, very safe in terms of uh, uh, the strength, the durability, as well as in terms of safety with uh, imaging like MRI. It is MRI compatible. So uh, we started using the sternal five, uh, number five sternal wire for reconstruction in our chest wall uh, tumors because we need we thought we it, it needs some form of reconstruction because uh, the integrity of chest wall is very, very important. This was our article published in the Indian General Thoracic Surgery in 2017, where we described our technique of neo rip reconstruction using the number five steel wire wherein we basically drilled both end of the ribs or the sternum or the vertebra, and then threaded the sternal wire and then looped it such a way that we have a double layer or a triple layer or a four layer of wire. So the sternal wire as such, if we see, is basically not very, very rigid and it can be molded to the desired contour. 
So using this technique, I mean, we started repairing our chest wall tumors. And very important thing about uh, chest wall tumor, they do have intrathoracic uh, component, a pleural component. So uh, it's always very good uh, to put in a scope like this. This is a chondrosarcoma in the left side. We put in our scope here. We can see here that uh, the tumor is there. There are some flimsy additions. And uh, this is the external view. We've got a white uh, area and we've included the skin where the biopsy was done. Uh, so under vision from an endoscopic thoracoscopy, you can basically decide which rib you're going to basically excise because you can see uh, the tumor is mainly intrathoracic. We can see that the swelling is more intrathoracic. So using a thoracoscopy is also a very, very good tool in terms of uh, resecting chest wall tumor. This is a case of endometrial carcinoma with bony metastasis involving mainly in the postural lateral part. You can see here the image. It is basically below the scapula. It is not behind the scapula, it's below the scapula. So we went ahead, did a resection. We excised uh, the rib. In what it was involving about, we excised about three to four ribs. You can see here there are three wires running here. So these three wires are basically connecting the two ends, and then we have uh, crisscross it to make it more stable. And that's the latissimus dorsi muscle, which is basically placed after putting a proline mesh over there. And this is how it looks. And this is the image of two years. You can see that uh, there has been no breakage in the wire and it looks stable. And this is the image at two and a half years. You can also see here that there's been absolutely no breakage in the wire. So you can say that, I mean, these are cases wherein a local sternal wire does serve the purpose of the same thing using a very expensive implant. We can uh, use this thing, which is durable at two years, we can see that it's basically not uh, fractured or anything. The second case with sternal chondrosarcoma, you can see here, it's basically involving the body of sternum and the subsephoid area. It was well away from the venerable sternal junction. So we did a wide excision and we preserved the mandibulum part. That's the first strip and the clavicle area. This was the specimen we excised along with all the pericardium. You can see here that's the tumor which has been excised and blocked. So in this case, ideally, if we had a metallic implant, we could have put uh, metallic implants or the titanium plate from both ends. But because of the cost factor, we use this modified external wire neurip technique. You can see here, that's how it is. We, we did it. Then we put a mesh over it, and then we approximated the pec major muscle over it and closed it. This is the image uh, done after about a year. And this is the image done at about uh, nearly one and a half years, this last, just last month only. You can see here uh, in the CT imaging, there has been no compromise in the chest wall integrity anteriorly. It is not, it has not sunken down. You can very clearly see the implants, the wires are intact, and we do not see any uh, breakage of fracture at least, which is something we get, uh, we are worried about if the wires get fractured. So this is again a third rib wherein, I mean, we are basically doing uh, osteosarcoma. It was involving basically the rib as well as the, if we see again the image, the rib, posterior part as well as the part of the vertebra. It was not going intraspinal. So these are cases wherein we need a multimodality approach. So we uh, did this combined with a neurosurgeon, orthopedic surgeon. So we can see here that we have basically taken off the hemi vertebra on that side. And they've put a cage there for intraspinal fixation. And we have approximated this area with using a same neuri technique because we excise about four ribs, though it was posteriorly. And then you can see here, that's the image, the X-ray. And this is the CT scan done about two years post-surgery. You can see that the integrity is maintained and uh, the wound has healed perfectly over this side. The same patient is still doing very much well. Uh, after almost two years from this CT scan. And uh, so, I mean, uh, if you get a good resection, R0 resection, such cases can be done using a combined approach, multimodality using all our, uh, to the extent of resecting as much as possible. But we need to basically uh, do it as a multimodality. So for a successful reconstruction, it's important that uh, we have to maintain the skeletal, uh, we retain the skeletal stability. We need to preserve the respiratory dynamics and we have to also basically protect intrathoracic organs. 
And most importantly, we should avoid thoracoplasty like contraction. That's especially when you're doing in the apical portion part of the chest, because this becomes something like a surgery for tuberculosis where they do thoracoplasty just to collapse the lung. And of course, it should be cosmetically acceptable. And we should always, always try for an R0 resection, which is the basic principle of any chest wall surgery. Uh, so in the future, it will be basically about more and more of 3D printing. Then, of course, something like tissue bioprinting and uh, some implants with therapeutic capacity that's called a nano system might come in later on. Then these are basically about the future. If we see at the guidelines, we don't have any definitive guidelines, but this is one Indian guideline. It's from the National Cancer Grid, which basically suggests how to manage a chest wall tumor. So it talks about uh, uh, any swelling in the chest or chest pain. We can get an X-ray done, a CT chest, a solid mask, then it, a CT scan is done. If not, uh, after that, you can get a tissue diagnosis using a CT or ultrasound or a direct guided biopsies. And a PET CT is advocated for PNET and lymphomas. And for PNET, it's basically chemotherapy and then local treatment, surgery if resectable. And chondrosarcoma, sarcomas, and lymphomas, again, mostly surgery. And lymphomas, again, is a different group, but it's basically chemotherapy. So this is what we have from the National Cancer Grid Guidelines. So I'll just talk about some other ones from outside. This is an expert consensus on resection of chest wall tumor and chest wall reconstruction. This is basically from the Chinese group, basically to find a consensus on controversial points about surgical treatment for chest wall tumors. It's basically an updation of the chest wall uh, Chinese expert consensus for chest wall reconstruction wherein they call about 85 world experts. This was done in 2021. This last year only was published. Uh, 85 world experts and found an opinion about some uh, controversial part, basically based on uh, direct questioning and getting a consensus. So based on the expert approval, they made three categories of one, two, and three. If it was one, more than 80% of the experts approved or recommended that Category two was about 60 to 80 percent of experts uh, agreeing to it, this particular form of treatment. Category three was basically just 40 to 60 percent agreeing to that modality of treatment. So they had six uh, questionnaire or consensus. I will just go through those consensus points. Basically, consensus one was wide excision should be performed for this small tumor of chest wall. Uh, category one, that's basically about more than 80 percent agreed to it. After excluding distant metastasis by MDT, solitary plasma cytoma of the chest wall can be treated. This is can be treated, not to be treated with extensive resection and adjuvant radiotherapy, category three. Yes, because in this case, I think it's basically radiation, which is the first preference. Consensus two, wide excision with about two centimeter margin should be attempted to obtain R0 resection margin for chest wall tumor. This was category one. Most of the people agreed that two centimeter margin was adequate. Given the difficulty of reconstructive surgery for adjacent organs, including the heart, great vessels, trachea, joint, and spine, it is unnecessary to obtain enough resection margin distance if the chest wall tumor involves these vital organs. So just about 60 to 80 percent agreed on this category two. So I mean, we cannot really, uh, if it is a vital structure, yes, that uh, can be agreed upon, but we should try and get as much as uh, margin as possible, at least beyond two. However, the tissue adjacent to the chest wall tumor, example, layer of fascia should be removed as much as possible. As for manubrium, sternai tumors, capsularis, articularis, sternoclaviculis can be used as a safe margin marker if the tumor does not invade the joint capsule. So about 60 to 80% agree that uh, we can go do with a disarticulation at this uh, side, sternoclavicular side. The consensus, third consensus, for patient with chest wall tumor undergoing unplanned excision for the first time, it is necessary to carry out wide excision as soon as possible with one to three within one to three months following previous surgery. So most of them agreed, eighty percent beyond agreed, it should be re-excised. Wide excision with about with above two centimeter margin. Distance should be attempted to remove the residual tumor. Again, most agreed, 80% and above agreed. Adjuvants, radiotherapy or systemic therapy should be performed according to specific situation of free resection. Most did not agree with this. 
about 46 percent only agreed so consensus statement four current tumor uh, tnm staging of bone and soft tissue sarcomas of the trunk x and extremities are not suitable for chest wall sarcoma and it is necessary to develop new staging criteria for chest wall sarcoma 60 to 80 percent of the respondent agreed but because of the rarity of this tumor this is difficult so it's basically the pathological result have to be exploited in that depending on the location of chest wall sarcoma lymph node dissection may be performed in the surgically visible area or adjacent mediastinal area so this is i think something that most did not agree uh, just 46 percent said lymph node dissection should be performed Consensus five, is it necessary to use rigid implants for chest wall reconstruction for chest wall defects exceeding five centimeters in adults? 40, 60 to 80 percent agreed that reconstruction to, should be done in adults. For adolescents, again, it's a tricky question because of the growths. So most do not agree some form of uh, rigid chest wall reconstruction in adolescent group at a growing age. Titanium plate and mesh are the most commonly used rigid implants. Personalized implants such as 3D printed implants have the advantage of anatomically repairing the chest wall defect. So the last consensus for NSCLC invading the stress wall, white excision is recommended for patient with stage T34 N0 to N1 group. I think this is standard we uh, follow. We agree to it that if it is a chest wall with N0, N1 uh, nodal status, upfront surgery is something we should be done and towards the end i think this is something i would like to give as a take-home message so for any uh, defect which is more than five centimeter we need some form of uh, reconstruction by using a mesh uh, and or maybe an implant depending on uh, the choice of the surgeon and some form of uh, uh, muscle cover for four or more ribs are removed, and especially if it is the anterior side or anterior lateral wall and lower down, these are the sites where most of the maximum respiration takes place. So some form of reconstruction should be added in this. That's basically anterior, anterior or anterior lateral defects. And for full thickness defects, obviously we need basically both um, skeletal cover, soft tissue and skin cover. For epico posterior defects, which are basically covered by scapula and shoulder girdle. These are the exceptions wherein we don't need to really use some osteosynthesis. Some form of mesh to cover it is yeah. adequate. And uh, the exception in this case is that if the defect is basically uh, lying just above the scapula, it's important that we have some form of recon done because we don't want the scapula to uh, uh, um, invaginate or uh, in herniate into the chest wall cavity. Mm. So I think uh, with this, I will come to the end. And uh, again, if we see as such, some will advocate reconstruction all chest wall defect because it avoids, avoids patient perception of basically some form of chest wall instability, which we all know after any thoracic surgery, people do have some amount of uh, perception that this area is numb. And when you have a loss of tissue in the rear, they definitely feel that this area has got some weakness. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Dalong, for that uh, wonderful expert talk. We now come uh, to the last segment, which is Q&A with our experts. Uh, we would like to start uh, with Dr. Sindhir Rajapayas. The first question was for the statistics segment. So, sir, the question for you is, is there an acceptable margin of benefit when which is to be considered clinically significant while interpreting major clinical trials? Uh, so the simple answer is no. I think it's like the beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So it depends upon how desperate you are to take that benefit, however small or large it is. Uh, but what we are doing now is moving away from, you know, absolute benefits of 1%, 2% or, a, you know, a 20% difference in terms of the hazard <coughs> ratio and so on and so forth to, what's called as a, a magnitude of clinical benefit scale. For example, the ESMO has a magnitude of clinical benefit scale. Uh, so where they will consider whether there is a, an overall survival benefit or if it's just a disease-free or a progression-free survival benefit, what's the quality of life and so on and so forth. So they come up with a composite score rather than just considering one factor. Uh, but ultimately, uh, 
what the ASCO did a few years ago was that if you have a hazard ratio of let's say 0.8, which means there's a 20% risk reduction that was supposed to be clinically significant. Similarly, in terms of uh, progression-free survival in the metastatic setting, a progression-free survival benefit of two months was supposed to be clinically ben beneficial or clinically significant. So I think the simple answer is there's nothing like a cutoff that you can have to say that uh, this is beneficial or not. It depends upon the context, how rare the malignancy is, what are the treatments that are available at that point in time and what the patient ultimately perceives as beneficial. Let's not forget this. We may sit in conferences and, and not talk for hours together and split hairs over these numbers. But at the end of the day, the consumer, as they say, is the patient. So if these numbers are beneficial in the eyes of the patient, I think that's what is most relevant as far as I'm concerned. Thank you, sir. Uh, coming to our uh, topic for the day, uh, to Dr. Dalong, uh, this question comes from Dr. Arvind Ramkumar, who's a consultant surgical oncologist in uh, Bangalore. So his question for you was, uh, what are your considerations while reconstructing pediatric chest wall defects? So how would your size differ? See, I don't have much experience with doing pediatric chest wall reconstruction, but uh... In adolescents and uh, younger age group, you know they are growing. So we don't want any, I mean, uh, implants, metallic implants, osteosensory materials. So anything which we will put, will basically try and put something absorbable, a mesh which is absorbable, a PTFE, uh, something like that. We sh we would like to avoid any implants. I mean, which is osteosynthetic. That would be my personal take on it. Right. Do we have other examiners, Dr. Devyani, Dr. Abhishek Jain? Uh, do you have any opinion on this question? Uh, see, again, uh, even I have no experience with pediatric chest wall reconstruction, so no, no idea. All right. Uh, do we? Yeah. Uh, Dr. Raman, sir, uh, are you still there? Okay. So, we'll go on to the next question for now. Uh, in evenings, we discussed about margins pre-chemo versus post-chemo. Uh, the question is, can we apply the Kawaguchi barrier concept here and only strip periosteum from adjacent ribs. Uh, Dr. Devyani, could you take this question? Uh, so I don't think that's a, there's a simple right or wrong uh, answer to this question. But uh, in my opinion, um, you have one good chance at a margin negative resection. So like we discussed, um, a four centimeter might not always be achievable. An absolute pre-chemo margin might not always be achievable. But whatever we can do to get a non-controversially negative margin and avoid a re-excision or another form of adjuvant like radiation, we should do. So keeping that in mind, another rib here or there would probably be a safer alternative than trying to scringe on a rib and save it with the periosteal stripping is what I would think. Right. Uh, any difference of opinion from the other examiners? Okay. Yeah, I think, I mean, uh, no. if we talk about ribs, one rib extra, I think it doesn't really, uh, it's going to really change the program and uh, the surgery. I think we can always move one extra rib. Right. So, uh, right. our next question comes to Dr. Abhishek Jain. Uh, in sternal defects, how important do you think it is to anchor the sternoclavicle joints? into your reconstruction and uh, what shoulder morbidity uh, do you expect if you are not doing so? Yeah, so uh, I think uh, whenever possible, one should always uh, reconstruct the sternoclavicular joint, uh, except for uh, the resection of very, very huge lesions like the one uh, Devyani discussed in the case capsule when it is uh, not possible, but whenever possible, it should always be reconstructed. And uh, there is, of course, a shoulder morbidity uh, of not doing uh, that uh, reconstruction. Uh, and that morbidity, uh, th there is an instability in the shoulder joint movement. And the uh, uh, morbidity is similar to the one seen in patients uh, uh, operated for pancos tumors. 
uh, the patients who were previously operated by Dartwell's approach, you know, in in uh, that approach, uh, uh, clavicleectomy was done, and the patients used to land in uh, severe shoulder uh, instability. And to counter that, modified Dartwell's approach was devised, in which uh, there is complete preservation of the sternoclavicular joint. So definitely, whenever possible, one should always do it. <laughs> Uh, um, last question for uh, Dr. Dalong. I know you already commented on it. So, would you be uh, always doing a VATS in deciding resection lines uh, uh, for chest wall tumors? Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, it doesn't add any uh, extra. It doesn't take extra time of yours. Just putting a scope inside. It's always, I mean, very very safe, especially when the tumor is mainly intrathoracic extension. It got so uh, putting a scope doesn't really what you call uh, increase of operative time, definitely it helps us in deciding which level of rip you go because you want to go at least one rip beyond that. So I think uh, adding VATS is a very, very much plus point, especially with the 30 degree scope. Right. Hmm. So uh, these are the questions from uh, our end. Uh, first, I would like to personally thank from my side, uh, Dr. Darlong, Dr. Uh, Abhishek Jain, Dr. Devyani, as well as Dr. Sintel Rajapa for answering these questions uh, so patiently. Uh, we come to the end of uh, today's webinar. Uh, I call upon our secretary, Dr. Chandra Mohan, sir, to kindly deliver his uh, vote of thanks. Thank you, Sejan. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yeah, let me thank uh, the... First of all, uh, it's a wonderful program. And uh, Dr. P.K. Das, Dr. Anna Gupta, Dr. Sarenki, Dr. Rajaraman, and Dr. Arun Chaturvedi, uh, the senior top leaders of ISO were in the panel. And uh, today's discussion was about a uh, chest wall tumor, which is pretty much rare, but it is very straightforward tumor and very important in their practice perspective. And it's very tough to manage as well. So as the candidate rightly pointed out, uh, I don't think many of the candidates will be seeing more than three, four cases in their training period. So it's very important to discuss this topic. And I really appreciate other candidates, Dr. Rahul Gupta and Dr. Sugantha Arya, who uh, exceeded their expected expectations on them. And again, coming to the uh, examinees, I thank Dr. Darlong for the fantastic uh, moderator of the session, as well as the, uh, the expert talk, and Dr. Abhishek Jain for his contribution as an examiner. And special thank to Dr. Devyani for uh, bringing all uh, the slides, putting a lot of effort and uh, having such wonderful discussion. I think the real effort was from Devyani other than the organizers. And I really thank Dr. Raman Deshpande, one of the father figures of uh, thoracic oncology in the country for uh, being with us today. And of course, all the credits, all the time, all the uh, uh, praise goes to the Dr. Subramani Rao and Dr. Srijan Shukla for continuing with the fantastic program for a couple of years, and which is one of the master flagship programs of ISO. And uh, uh, I really appreciate Dr. Sandil Rajapa. I think uh, listening to him anywhere is a pleasure because the way he is uh, presenting uh, topics, uh, which is uh, so tough, even for a surgical oncologist, I think we, we are happy. And I, I really comment upon your uh, one of your slides you show that, you know, the Survival curve, curve should be wider enough so that you know this, we should be able to drive a Lamborghini or aircraft through it. But I think that today's today nowadays what happens is a lot of mafia pharma connections are going on, and many of uh, the medical oncologists will be pushed to uh, give uh, inefficient chemotherapy and target therapy so that you know you can drive a Lamborghini through your uh, narrow gullies. I, I think we should resist that. And uh, again, uh, uh, really has off to you, uh, the team, uh, Dr. Subramani Sarao, sir. Uh, I think that you know, we have to uh, widen our net and involve more and more institutions. Uh, there are uh, nearly 36 institutions awarding uh, MCH in surgical oncology, as well as 45 institutions awarding uh, DNB in surgical oncology. And we should involve more of the faculty from there. I have forwarded the list of uh, these two lists to you, both of you. And please see to it that you know, we have a better, successful, wider program next and I really thank the whomsoever all attended. The attendance went up to, in Zoom, it went up to 100 and, and uh, now uh, people are leaving. Of course, I think this is going to be a gajan of information which is available in YouTube also for the future. I think it's very, very useful for the uh, 
people appearing for exams. And I really, really think that and as an examiner, I have seen that after um, uh, uh, starting such programs, the standard of the candidate has gone significantly up. And we really salute uh, the organizers and thank uh, all of you and thank uh, the JISO. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, our next meeting is going to be on 27 January. Uh, the topic is going to be vulval cancer. We thank everyone for attending today's webinar. We wish you all a very good night. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good night.